Shock one two. Over. Shock one two. Check check check. Hey, check one two. Work for me. Can you hear me? Not you. No, it's just a mic. Oh, good. Some folks are still getting saddled and getting their coffee and their food, but we're at eight o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started on this Valentine's Day. I'm Dana Fulton. I'm a meteorologist at WKOW, and our station is a proud media sponsor for all of these one on one events. I'd like to welcome all the in-person people here today, as well as those folks that are joining us virtually soon. Uh, those virtual folks will have the opportunity later on to also join in our q and So again, happy Valentine's Day. I'm glad that we have some nice weather to get everyone out and about to join us. Today's topic really flows right into the mood of the day. It's called Love in the Lakes. And we're going to talk about uh, a look at fish and plants and organisms in the Ohio Lakes that we produce there. So just like humans and other animals, this process is important because it will dive into how genes are actually passed on and how parents protect their offspring in a lake full of predators. We are going to have a QA session at the end. So remember if you're virtual, you can use that Q function on your screen. We're going to try to get to as many questions as possible after the presentation, but if not, we will look for email opportunities to actually make sure everyone gets their answers. Before before we start that talk, though, I want to introduce the comments of its executive director, James Ty. He's going to tell us a little bit more about today's speaker as well as the organization. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Dana, and happy Valentine's Day. There's some people here today wearing red, and maybe uh, you at home are also wearing red uh, to get ready to celebrate this wonderful day. Um, I'd like to thank everybody here for joining us in person at the Edgewater as well on, as online. I also like to really thank our sponsors on, on the screen with our presenting sponsor, National uh, NGL, National Life Insurance Company, our wonderful hosting sponsor, the Edgewater, which hosts this series and is also the presenting sponsor for Frozen Assets, our supporting sponsor, Johnson Financial Group and the UW Nelson Environmental Studies and also UW Extension. As Dana said, we're also very thankful for WKOW Channel 27 for being our sponsor throughout the year. Well, we're into the second month of the year, and of course, it's the annual campaign. Uh, it's really important for people to donate to the Clean Lakes Alliance as a friend, as a person, as a family, or as a business. That annual campaign helps us do our programs, our advocacy work, our educational work, our monitoring, 
And it's really important to support those things. And we raise money every year for this annual campaign. So if you donated before, please renew. If maybe you donated $65 last year, maybe do $100 this year. If you're a business, we would love to have you join us. We have over 291 businesses who are our late partners. Uh, please think about that. Or if you know somebody who owns a business or runs a business, maybe suggest it to them. Back to today's talk, which is one of my favorite ones that we do on an, almost on an annual basis, is uh, Love in the Lakes. Um, it's just a really fascinating topic uh, to find out what's going on. Like a lot of times we're talking about runoff or uh, different things, but this is actually what's going on with the ecosystem underneath the, the lakes and the food chain. Um, we're also really uh, excited to have the presenter today, who is a dear friend of the Clean Lakes Alliance and former intern for several years in 14, 15, and 16. Uh, Justin uh, is just a really passionate person, and you'll hear it today in his voice. Um, before he joined the Clean Lakes Alliance, he was wrecking many invasive plants in the Charles River outside of Boston. He has his master's degree in water resource management from University of Wisconsin, and is currently working for the Wisconsin Department of DNR in the Water Quality Bureau. Uh, he was working on a number of projects for like water quality, ecology, and citizen scientists. Please welcome Justin. Talk will be better with pictures. <laughs> well, there you go. That's thank you, Paul. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, thanks everybody for being here today. Love is in the air and it's also in the lakes. Um, so we'll be talking about um, aquatic reproduction strategies uh, for creatures that live in and around the Har Lakes today. Um, yeah, so I'll start off with a lecture slide. Um, we have some guiding questions that we'll kind of keep in the back of our minds as we uh, move through the different organisms today. Um, first one, um, you know, we're going to be comparing the reproductive strategies of these different organisms. Um, and I put two words up there to kind of help us think about that. So like investment is a, is a big one. Um, you know, just like we invest money to, you know, have a payoff later for retirement or something like that. These organisms are investing time and energy into reproduction um, and their pay payoff being the successful uh, next generation of that species. Um, and But, you know, to do that, there's also going to be trade-offs. So I also put up there. Um, you can't have everything you want. Um, so as an organism, you, you would love to be able to just produce tons of offspring um, who are all very uh, successful and competitive and never get eaten by predators and uh, have an excellent chance of survival. But that's not all possible, and especially some of these trade-offs are going to come at the expense of the parent um, of this species, um, and they're kind of like trading off their own health. Um, or in, in a lot of, for organisms, a lot of time, what they're investing is time and energy, um, and they're doing it in different ways to to that's advantageous for their species and in their place in the environment. Um, but there's always a consequence when you invest a lot in one thing; you can't invest in something else. Um, We'll, we'll think about how the particular strategy helps the species succeed in its environment. All the species we're going to be looking at today are like very successful. They've been around longer than humans. And so um, whatever they're doing, it, it's working for them. And so we'll kind of think about how uh, the particular strategies we're talking about fit into the ecological niche that the species, what it's doing in the lake and how it uh, grows and survives. There's going to be obstacles that these species have to overcome in order to um, to successfully produce the next generation. It's going to be different for each species. Um, and we'll also kind of think about like our relationship with this species. A lot of time, you know, uh, you know, reproduction is, is, you know, a really important um, time of year for a lot of these species and the way they go about it. 
Um, and often interactions with humans, if they occur like um, interacting with the reproductive strategy, it can be it can you a lot of consequences. So we'll, our first organism today will be northern pike, which is will be familiar to hopefully everybody in the room. Um, you know, so it's a large predatory game fish. Um, it's largely uh, piscivorous. It eats a lot of other fish. We'll also talk about uh, blue whale, which are smaller. Um, they they're still they eat fewer fish. They they will target anything that will fit in their mouths. But a lot of the time, that's aquatic insects um, and and worms and things. We'll also move on beyond the world of vertebrates to Daphnia, um, which is another favorite at, I know, at uh, Clean Lakes Alliance events. There's a lot of talk about Daphnia, so we'll get into how they reproduce, and it's going to be very different than fish. Um, and then we'll get into uh, zebra mussels, which we are not big fans when they reproduce, but again, they're very, very successful. You can't argue with that, so we'll talk about how their reproductive strategy helps them spread. And then we'll also uh, look at leeches. Um, so, uh, really interesting, uh, organism that has some different tricks up its sleeve, um, compared to some of these other, uh, you know, fish and, and things. Um, so we'll get right into it, um, with Northern Pike. So again, this is a large, uh, piscivorous fish. It's a solitary hunter. It's going to cruise a lot of the time, uh, the weed edges of, of lakes, um, kind of looking in the weeds for, uh, other fish to it could eat. It's got the teeth, uh, to show it. Um, and it is, it will definitely, it will eat anything that will fit um, in its mouth. Um, and a lot of times that is bluegill or other fish um, on the smaller side. Um, but it's, it's, it's got this torpedo body shape, which is great for ambushing and accelerating and um, capturing prey. Um, and we have a trophy pike fishery here in the, the Ahara chain of lakes, um, which is like something really to be proud of. And a lot of these uh, pike that you'll see um, if you're lucky enough to pull one up through the ice or or off a boat, um, they're often larger than three feet in length, right? So once you reach that size, um, there's basically nothing in the lake that can threaten you, um, you know, beyond like disease or something like that, um, or, or an accident or, you know, getting hit by something. Um, once, you, when, once you've reached that size of the pike, uh, nothing, no other fish is going to eat you. Um, so how do you give your young the best chance of reaching that large size, right? Um, pike start out looking like this. Um, so in this image, um, kind of around the, the back, that is the, the spine of the, the fish that's about to hatch and become a, a small a fry. And you've also got the two large yolk sacs there, which are full of nutrients. Um, and uh, so that this is basically a, a delicious morsel for most things in the lakes, aquatic insects um, could eat this. This is, you know, very, very small. Um, and so pike, when they start out, are extremely vulnerable in this stage. Um, and uh, so part of the strategy for the pike is going to be to minimize the time spent at this extremely vulnerable stage and also place these young in, uh, in an environment where they have the best chance of success. And this is um, kind of uh, how it works. Um, so this is an image of uh, you, so uh, you can see water in the in the foreground, and also uh, you see some dead vegetation or senescing vegetation. Um, but also imagine you know you can imagine in a that water is also kind of spread back here, um, in like up to a foot deep, maybe back in these areas. You know, if you're a fish, you could squeeze between these reeds and get in there. Um, so this is like kind of what it might look like uh, a, a successful pike nursery. So what's going on? Um, uh, in, in this time of year, the pike, they're, you know, they're very sensitive to water temperature, um, environmental cues. And so right around when water uh, reaches 45 degrees Fahrenheit, the pike are starting to look for places like this. And they, can, they will actually swim under the ice um, and kind of find their way upstream or out of a lake um, to look for areas like this. So the shallow water inundated vegetation, uh, large areas that where the water is shallow and spread out, that is what they're looking for. Um, and uh, they reach an area like this and um, they got all excited about mating and the females will go around uh, and start depositing eggs. Um, and part of the strategy is to not put all your eggs in one place. That's, part, that's kind of part of their reproductive strategy is to spread the eggs uh, patches around in different areas. The females are doing that. And there's a group of males following after the female and fertilizing all of those eggs. 
Um, so you can already see some of the, the investment I was talking about, right? The pike, um, this is not, you know, great habitat for adult pike to find their food. Um, they're going here to reproduce because it gives the young a better chance. So they're investing time and energy to get to a place like this. The males can actually sustain injury from like vigorous, you know, competing for space behind the female. There's actually, you know, they can actually hurt each other by slapping with their fins and whatnot. It's very like a vigorous activity. So they're also expending energy doing that. They have to get that energy back by going hunting eventually. Um, so, so the adults are investing a lot of time to get here and place the eggs and if you look under the water, um, this, the key here is that there's all these strands of vegetation and the eggs are adhesive and they're going to stick to these um, strands of vegetation. And that's really important because it keeps them from settling down into the sediment where they might get covered um, and then they would get starved of oxygen. So the eggs need oxygen just like fish do, um, you know, uh, most aqu aquatic Organisms, especially fish, they're all using oxygen in the water. So it's especially important to keep these eggs um, oxygenated at a time where obviously they can't move, they're waiting to hatch, they're getting fertilized. Um, so a female will deposit thousands and thousands of eggs in little uh, bundles attached to this vegetation. Uh, they'll get fertilized. And then another reason why this habitat is so great, so the, the water here is shallower than, you know, obviously than a deep lake. And so it's going to warm up faster relative to yeah, like, like a lake or a deep pond or something. It, it's, you know, it's literally like, it's so shallow that the pike will like, you know, they'll almost have their fins sticking out the back, um, trying to get up into these shallow areas. And that's all because they want the water to be warmer around their eggs so that the eggs develop faster. Because, um, you know, the faster you can develop and grow, then, uh, you know, the, the faster you're going to get big enough to maybe evade some predators or to start eating yourself. The pike, um, the young become uh, carnivorous at a very young age. They're actually cannibalizing one another a little bit. Um, and so it pays to really grow as fast as you can and start eating other things really quickly. Um, so the, the pike on the left side of this image, um, obviously they still got that yolk sac there. So they're very, very young. They are, um, uh, you know, still very, obviously the pennies there, they're very, very small. Um, and those are also very vulnerable, but they can at least move around a little bit. So they're not quite as vulnerable as that uh, egg I showed earlier. And the pike on the right side is a little bit um, past the size where it would have left the nursery area. Generally, that's around two to three inches in length and they'll start leaving that nursery area. But I wanted to put these images up just to make the point that you know, the pike on the right side is still vulnerable. Um, there's definitely fish that could swallow that thing, um, no problem. But even getting to that size um, is already given it a much greater chance of success than it was just as an egg. There are thousands of eggs put out. Most of them are going to perish. But if you can if you can make it past, you know, get to this size and then get a little bit bigger, every time you increase your size, there are a lot fewer threats um, in the lake. And then eventually, you know, once once you get bigger and bigger, you get to an adult pike. Again, that's the, that's the sweet spot where you can reproduce for many years in a row. Pike will live, you know, um, you know, more than a decade and, and successful individuals can reproduce after the, uh, I think second around, usually the second year around here. Um, but, you know, even just increasing your size a little bit, that's, that's fewer and fewer things that can fit you in their mouth and eat you. So these are the type of pike we all like to see. Um, you know, this, this is a large individual. This, I'm not sure if this is from Wisconsin, it's just an old photo to emphasize. It's also that, you know, we've been around pike for a long time. They've been a popular game fish for a long time. Um, but one thing to keep in mind and kind of, you know, part of our interaction with these species, because it's such a popular game fish, um, is to think about um, the amount of eggs or, or sperm that these individuals are able to produce and contribute to um, to the next generation. So if you have a pike that's um, one foot in length um, and you double the length and now it's two feet long, um, you're probably more than doubling the amount of eggs or the amount of sperm that individual is able to produce. It's more like an exponential growth. So the largest individuals um, who are also the least vulnerable and um, you know catching a lot of prey, the, the largest individuals contribute disproportionately to the eggs or the sperm for the next, gener next generation. They can be super successful breeders. Um, so... Um, you know, this, this comes into play when you think about conservation and management of a, of a fishery. So a lot of the times there'll be specific size limits, um, and that, those can vary um, depending on what the lake is being managed for. 
But if you're a fisheries manager, you know that, you know, like a, if, you know, keeping a, a pike twice as long um, is again, more than doubling the kind of reproductive capacity of that individual. So the large individuals are especially valuable. Um, so if you do end up pulling up big pike in Madison, it's always a good idea to think about putting them back. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what the current regulations are, but I think there's there's a lot of uh, pike that, that you don't keep in the Madison lakes because we're trying to grow those large individuals for the fishery. Um, but in any case, you know, keep in mind that these these large individuals are often yeah huge contributors um, to the to the next generation. Um, and the uh, the other thing I'll point out is um, if you remember actually flip back, so this type of area. Um, if that's prime pike nursery habitat, well, that's basically a wetland. Um, these are areas where, especially when um, the water level is rising in spring, these areas become flooded and inundated. Um, and unfortunately, we've lost a lot of wetlands um, across the, the nation and in Wisconsin and in Dane County. Um, so the more wetlands that we're able to preserve, especially those that are connected to other bodies of water so the pike can go up and you know come from the deep lake where they like to hunt, um, where they spend a lot of time and find these areas that are shallower, that are warmer in the spring, um, especially with this inundated vegetation again, um, so the eggs have something to attach to, um, that's like uh, really key for them. And so, you know, as we think about um, conservation and uh, how to keep a great fishery, it's really about habitat. Um, and that's going to be, you know, if you give the pike a good place to spawn, then they're probably going to be okay. So we'll start a little... Uh, little chart here to kind of track the different species. So uh, pike are producing uh, more than 50,000 eggs is not uncommon in a season for a large individual. Um, but again, few of those are going to survive. And that is part of the strategy. They have to invest a lot initially because those young are so vulnerable, even though they do put a lot of effort to find a good nursery. Um, if they were to just deposit those eggs on the lake bed, the survival would be even lower. Um, and yeah, I put the biggest obstacle to their success is probably habitat loss, just because we've, uh, you know, we humans don't tend to like wetlands and we tend to pave them over or drain them or something. So the more wetlands we can keep around, especially again, those connected to other bodies of water, that's going to be good for pike. All right. So now we're moving on to a much smaller fish. Uh, bluegill are not, um, they're predators in the sense that they'll hunt aquatic insects, especially that's a big part of their diet. Um, and they'll probably they'll probably eat, you know, uh, smaller fish that they could fit in their mouths, but they're not um, piscivorous like pike. So they don't have the same teeth. Um, they don't have the same strategy. They're shaped differently. You can see um, pan fish because they fit in the pan. Um, and their, their strategy is going to be about providing more parental care to their young. Um, so pike went to a lot of effort to find a good nursery, but then after the eggs are fertilized, all those pike are, are out. So what do bluegill do? Um, they're waiting a little bit longer into the spring. Um, they're waiting till water temperatures reach about 67 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's what, and again, they're, they're kind of responding to these environmental cues um, by instinct. And, and uh, there might be other things like, like blue length and other things going on, but in general, it's around you know, warmer temperatures. Um, and they're coming up to the shallows and the circles that you see right here are um, basically nests made by male bluegill. Um, these are called called reds, R E D D S. Um, so it's a, it's uh, you can kind of see in the middle of these circles there's some gravel or coarse material. The fish have cleared away the fine silty stuff and made a little crater with it, um, and they're very proud of this. Uh, they did a lot of work, and they really want the females to come and deposit eggs in their crater so that they can fertilize them. Um, so they're trying; they're working very hard. Again, this is an investment on the part of the males. Um, so they're moving things, they're, they're fanning in the, you know, as, as a small fish, even moving around this amount of material um, takes some time and effort. Um, you also notice that they're doing it all together. So it's a little colony of, of bluegill that are going to be here. Um, and that's, that's part of the reproductive strategy too, because the more individuals you have nesting together in a colony, um, the, the more likely you, you'll be able to see a predator coming. So they're all kind of there together. Um, and they can kind of keep an eye on things uh, as a unit. Um, so basically, the males make these nests. The females come through. Um, they will deposit their eggs in a nest if they like it, and the males fertilize it. Um, then soon after, the, those eggs are going to hatch, and the males actually stick around for that. They're going to stay for about 10 days, um, supervising the, the little uh, brood of fry who are going to like kind of hover um, over the, the nest. They're starting to swim. 
Um, and, and again, it's that kind of critical period where the, they're the most vulnerable. The males are going to expend additional energy and investment to stay with them and try and protect them from predators. Um, you know, the blue eel, it's not a large fish, but there are plenty of fish um, that would like to eat its fight that's big enough to, to force away. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, so the colony of blue eel will all be doing this. Um, and the males actually lose about 10% of their body weight during the time when they're um, supervising the fry because they can't, you know, like spend less time hunting. Um, mid parents in the room might appreciate that if you take all the time to supervise your young and make sure they're eating, that you might not be eating very much yourself. Um, so, and, but that's, you know, so that's an investment on the part of the males. But what if there's a way to skip all that? Um, so in the, in this photo, we've got a parental uh, male, it's a large individual here who probably built this little nest and cleared away a lot of fine sediment here. Um, and, uh, you know, so he, this, this individual invested a lot of time. He's got a female below him um, who, who's thinking about depositing eggs there. But we also have this guy, and this is another male, but it's a different type of male. And it's, it's called a sneaker male because they literally sneak up to the nest and fertilize um, the eggs that uh, the parental male was hoping to fertilize, and then they scoot away. So this is, you know, it's not a very nice thing to do. But this is a, a really good idea because the sneaker male here, for instance, it's, it's smaller, so it's a younger fish. You're get, if, if it's successful, this guy just got to reproduce at a young age for far less investment. Um, the parental male will, you know, if it's successful, the parental male will stick around and raise uh, this sneaker male's young and protect them. Um, meanwhile, the sneaker male can go off and try to grow and feed. Um, so it's kind of like uh, two different types of male bluegill are almost in competition with one another to uh, for the strategy of, of the reproductive strategy. And it's two very different strategies. You know, the parental male is making a lot of investment. Um, the sneaker male is trying to get away for free. Obviously, the, the parental male will, will bully away any uh, sneaker males that, um, that he finds near his nest and he'll kind of protect it. Um, but you know, it's not a lot of investment to try and sneak in, fertilize the eggs and then leave and you can try it again somewhere else. So it's kind of like a, a low investment strategy for the sneaker male if it pays off. There's some um, evidence that suggests that um, the parental males might um, have a way to kind of sense how much of the brew is actually their genetic offspring through uh, key, you know, basically smell or, or some sort of chemical signal coming from the young. Um, and if, if they're able to tell that, you know, a lot of the brood is not their own offspring, they'll actually invest less time and energy into protecting that brood and move along quicker and try to get another female and try to uh, do the cycle over again. So obviously the sneaker males are kind of taking advantage of the parental instincts of the parental males um, and that, but they couldn't do it without them. There'd have to be enough parental males around to make the sneaking strategy viable. The other thing that happens is these sneaker males can go up into a fish that, well, it's kind of hard to see it here, but it's, a, it's another fish that's got a prominent banding pattern. It's imitating a, an adult female, but it's another male. Um, so it's another strategy to try and let these parental males get close to the nest and fertilize eggs that they were intending to fertilize themselves. So the sneaker males will often uh, grow up into a female mimic and kind of continue with the same strategy. So it's really interesting that in bluegill, this kind of you know uh, strategy evolved. You can you can imagine this is kind of speculation, but as the, this as the blue fish was evolving and more you know as parental investment came into it, that eventually you know some mutation happened that some fish were like you know, obviously not consciously thinking this, but like, oh, maybe I can get away with, you know, take advantage of all these males who are just happy to raise the young. Maybe I can sneak in there, fertilize the eggs, pass on my genes to the next generation, and then also uh, not not do all this losing body weight stuff and uh, making myself more, more vulnerable um, for predators and things. Um, so, so a little more speculation, but you know, if you were, we have another great fishery here for bluegill on the Madison Lakes, and the parental males are bigger, so it's possible that anglers are preferentially um, removing them from the lake when they look at which fish they're trying to keep for their dinner. Um, but again, it all comes back to uh, habitat. So again, this this type of uh, area where the fish are trying to spawn, um, you can see that you know there's some human activity in the area. We also like to put things along the shoreline. 
Um, and that's a potential, you know, kind of uh, area of conflict. So also this could be a spot where um, maybe, um, depending on how the land was managed, there might be runoff and it might go right, you know, to these nests. I mean, if, and, you know, the males, they spent all that time removing the fine sediment from the nest because, again, that's a threat for the eggs. Um, if they get covered like that, then they'll uh, get starved of oxygen. So they actually, they clear the fine material from the nest and they'll actually fan the eggs with their tail as well to move water over them to make sure oxygen's reaching them. So things like, uh, you know, if a bunch of sediment came in here from a storm, um, or obviously, uh, you know, chemical pollution or, or pesticides or something like that, it could be delivered right to this, to this nest again, where there are, you know, cr very small fry, um, or eggs there. And that could be, you know, an example of how human activity might adversely impact uh, bluegill. And it's all about this, this shoreland habitat. They have to go near shore. They want their warmer water there. Um, and, um, Again, it's a critical time of year too. So if the time, you know, it, it's a particular time of year where they're most vulnerable to maybe some things that humans might do on the landscape that could affect this near shore area. So adding the, the bluegill to our chart here, they're producing fewer eggs overall than uh, pike, um, but still thousands of fry, high mortality for the young. Um, and their reproductive strategy is to be a good dad or a sneaky one. Um, and, you know, they're... Uh, if one of the obstacles is going to be habitat loss, they have more predators to think about as well. Um, so that's something that, uh, you know, again, they're in that communal um, kind of nesting area to kind of keep an eye on predators. So now we're going to leave the world of vertebrates um, and get into some different organisms. Um, Daphnia, so when you say Daphnia, that's a genus. Um, there are several species of Daphnia. Uh, there, there are many species of Daphnia. We have several in the, in the Madison Lakes. Um, they're actually very small crustaceans, um, and these are, you know, ultimately basically prey organisms. Uh, lots of things like to eat them. Um, they are an important part of the food chain in the lakes. Um, you can see they're kind of translucent. Um, they've got these, you know, weird looking arm things that they use to capture. Uh, uh, they're actually eating phytoplankton, so we like them in general because they eat algae, and the, with less algae, um, the, the water is clearer. Um, and, and we like that for lots of reasons, um, but, um, they are short lived and, um, they have to take advantage of the good times. So unlike fish, they're kind of working on a smaller time scale. Um, and since they're eating algae, we know that algae populations can change, uh, very quickly. Um, so different species of algae, not just, uh, blue green algae, but all types of algae and phytoplankton, um, so organisms in the lake that are harvesting energy from the sun and growing, um, those can boom and bust very quickly in a matter of weeks. Um, and so as a Daphne, you kind of want to be uh, ready to take advantage of if you have a sudden uh, glut of food and, and uh, good things to eat. Um, it might not be there for very long. And then, uh, you know, another uh, type of algae might bloom that's less palatable, that's not as nutritious. Um, and then winter might come and there's just less food overall and less, um, and water temperatures drop. So Daphnia have uh, something very special going on. We're going to spend a little bit of time with this diagram, um, but basically they, have, they can uh, use sexual reproduction or asexual reproduction. Um, we'll start with asexual reproduction. So that is kind of the inner circle on this diagram um, or the parthenogenic cycle. Um, so we'll start with this Daphnia. This is a female um, and it's got lots of eggs and it can just produce those eggs on its own without the help of any other Daphnia. Um, so you can kind of think of this as cloning. Um, the daughters, the parthenogenic daughters, are going to be virtually genetically identical to the mother. Um, and those daughters um, can very quickly turn around and make more daughters. It's a matter of weeks. Um, so again, this is a much faster timeline than fish. Um, it's not like a, a yearly kind of breeding cycle. It's whenever there's um, enough uh, available food, um, they can do this very, very quickly. So you can see how this would lead to an exponential growth in the amount of Daphnia. So if there is abundant food, if times are good, they're able to explode their population very quickly to react to that through this parthenogenic uh, breeding, basically cloning again. Um, and uh, that's really good because again, it's about taking advantage of the of uh, whatever's happening in the lake. Environmental conditions are good. Let's make lots of young. Um, but there is a downside to having all your individuals um, to be genetically identical. That means that everyone is equally success, uh, susceptible 
to something like a fungal infection. There is a particular type of fungus that can target daphnia. Um, I don't know, you know the details on this, but if generally, um, if you have more genetic variability in your population, there's more likely to be some individuals who are resistant to that particular fungus or a particular predator or a particular environmental um, stressor or uh, anything like that. Um, so if you're only producing asexually, your population is eventually very risky. Um, and it's likely that something's going to come along. Um, and if it can kill one thing, it's, it can kill everyone. So the sexual cycle on the outside, um, you know, a sexual reproduction, a, a big advantage of it is that it's producing genetically unique individuals um, from two parents. It's basically scrambling the genes of the parents to make uh, something totally unique. Um, the way it works with Daphnia is that the females can also have, oops, it'll come back, um, the part, it can have a parthenogenic son, and that son can go on to meet with a different Daphnia's daughter. Um, and the eggs that are forming here in this picture are, uh, those are unique genetic individuals. They have some genes from both parents. It's all scrambled up. And that's a good thing because um, if this is happening across the population, Daphne, you're getting lots of uh, different individuals with potentially new combinations of genes or mutations. Um, so yeah, so this uh, sexual egg, uh, it's got a little case. It's very sturdy. Um, there's only two eggs in there. Um, and it's got this protective casing. Um, and the really cool thing is these can drop to the bottom of the lake and they can actually remain viable for decades and up to 100 years. Um, and this is a really cool part of the strategy because basically every spring, some of these resting eggs are going to hatch. And so every spring you're getting um, new genetic information kind of injected into the population of Daphnia. And maybe those individuals, um, so in the case of the fungus, remember, um, you know, maybe the fungus was especially successful in year and attacked Daphnia and it got spread through the water. Um, and a lot of the clones that were equally susceptible to it passed away. Then in the next spring, maybe an egg will hatch with an individual who just happens to have a little bit of a more resistance to that fungus, or it can handle it a bit, a bit better or something. Well, if that um, fungus is still around, that individual can then reproduce asexually, and um, that and then that then many more Daphnia in the total population have that adaptation or that gene. Um, and so the combination of kind of sexual and asexual reproduction um, is really advantageous to Daphnia. Um, so I just want to point out, you know, these are almost microscopic organisms. You can um, you can still see them with your eye if, if the water is very clear and you see them darting around. But notice that um, the asexual reproduction on this side, so it's got eggs here, eggs here. Um, there's four or five eggs, whereas there's only two that were produced through sexual reproduction here. So that's kind of one of the trade-offs that we'll talk about. Um, so we'll kind of set up a little... Uh, versus uh, sexual versus asexual reproduction here. So sexual reproduction, again, gives you genetic variety. You have the hardy resting eggs that can remain in the lake bed for a long time and provide a, an injection of new uh, genes for the population every spring. It's kind of like insurance for the future. It's a, it's a little egg bank that um, some of them hatch, but some of them are resting and waiting for another time. That's going to be cued by different environmental conditions. Um, but again, that takes time and energy. And remember, you also have to go and find a Daphnia of a different sex um, to, to perform sexual reproduction. Um, whereas with asexual reproduction, it is fast and cheap. Um, when times are good, they're good, and you can make a lot of young Daphnia. For Daphnia, you can always switch over to sexual reproduction. If um, And that, that's uh, the Daphnia you know, are not think consciously thinking like we are. They're responding to environmental cues, uh, but th those environmental cues so like day length and temperature and stress and all that stuff can, um, can kind of push more of them towards sexual reproduction, saying, hey, things are not getting so good. Let's make sure we have some genetic variety in the population for next year um, and uh, you know, kind of create um, this insurance policy. Yeah, but overall, if you, if you only rely on asexual reproduction, your population is more vulnerable. And there are some, uh, I think, kind of like alpine lakes in Europe where they they think they've found populations of Daphnia that have lost the ability to reproduce sexually. Um, and for those populations, um, there's still some random mutation happening, but it's a lot less uh, variability in the overall population for kind of their total different amount of genes that they have. And so it's likely that eventually those populations, some some stressor or catastrophe or uh, 
you know, a disease might um, take them out and, and the entire population would be susceptible and they might, um, you know, totally disappear from that lake, lake if it's an isolated water body. Um, so yeah, so uh, the number of offspring depends on which method the Daphne are using. Uh, asexual reproduction gives you a little, a uh, little bit more. Um, it's, it's kind of you can kind of think of it as it's a fast method and the insurance method. So asexual is fast. Sexual reproduction is insurance. Um, some of the obstacles include spiny water flu, which I know Clean Lakes a lot also talks about. Um, that's an introduced predator that's uh, especially effective at eating Daphnia. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, there's, there, there was definitely a uh, shock when those first arrived, but, you know, it's possible that um, maybe there's a resting egg somewhere in Lake Mendota with uh, some Daphnia that has a, that can better evade spiny water flea maybe or something like that. Um, they're definitely applying pressure, you know, selective pressure to Daphnia population. If you're a Daphnia and you're less susceptible to spiny water fleas right now, you might be able to reproduce a lot more. Um, I put in also put in eutrophication. Um, so remember they're eating different types of algae. Um, and the general the general consensus is that the blue green algae, the cyanobacteria that can bloom in Lake Mendota and other lakes um, in the Madison chain, um, are generally less palatable um, for Daphnia. Um, it's it generally considered to be like a poor food source. So if we as humans um, you know, continue the eutrophication process and increase the, the frequency and severity of those blooms, um, that's likely kind of a poor food source for Daphne or else um, not a great food source at all. And that's kind of one way that we might interact um, with their ability to reproduce. All right, so now we'll talk about zebra mussels. Um, as much as we, you know, dislike them, yeah, you can't deny that whatever they're doing, it works. Um, so, what, yeah, we got one photo on the right from a Clean Lakes Alliance volunteer um, who noticed, you know, all the zebra mussel shells washing up on shore, and that's certainly that is, uh, you know, that that is the density that they can achieve um, in some areas. Um, generally, they need hard substrate, um, so they so a lot of the uh, lakes in the Madison chain are not. Like the, the total lake bottom is not all, all suitable for zebra mussels, um, but enough of it um, is, is obviously there if they're being very su successful in some areas. Um, yeah, and in general, uh, zebra mussels um, are of a concern or, um, you know, people are still investigating exactly what they're going to do to ecosystems and they can, uh, you know, do different things in the Great Lakes versus a small lake um, versus maybe our lakes here. Um, but in general, you know, they're filter feeders. Um, they can't move, um, so they attach to some to a substrate or a rock or something or your dock pier, and they're they're there um, for the rest of their lives. But that means that you have you have all these individuals along the lake bottom. Um, they are filtering uh, you know algae and things out of the water, and then obviously excreting on the on the lake bottom. So they're kind of like taking all these nutrients and things that are in the water column and putting them all on the bottom of the lake. And so they're kind of like uh, because they're, the water is moving past them constantly, they're filtering it. Um, all their waste ends up at the bottom of the lake, and so it's kind of like moving a bunch of nutrients to one part of the lake, um, and then also increasing the clarity of the water, which means sunlight can penetrate farther. If there's a lot of complex things that happen at that point, depending on what size the lake is and what other creatures are in there and everything, but basically that is a huge change to the way energy moves through the system, and that's how they can cause some of the things that uh, we're so concerned about. The other thing they do that's not great is they grow on stuff. Um, the photo on the left side is actually a current meter um, that's in the Great Lakes. Um, and the accuracy of that device has probably been reduced somewhat by the zebra mussels growing on it. And obviously they can do this to intake pipes and things as well. And so industrially, um, they can be a very big problem just because of the space they take up. But um, these are some very successful zebra mussels here. They're doing well. Um, so let's talk about... Um, Oh, I got, and one more, yeah, right. So the other thing they do is they can, there's, and there's a great, you know, the zebra mussel striping you can see really well. Um, they can grow on native clams and kind of uh, suffocate them. I've been told that I'm getting close to the end of time. So we'll move rather quickly through zebra mussels, but um, there's another great photo of them. This is the zebra mussel young. Um, it's called a villager. Um, zebra mussel is just, uh, they take their sperm or eggs and put them into the water column and hope that it beats up with a sperm or egg from another zebra mussel. Um, and that doesn't seem like a great strategy, except that they are all like kind of together a lot of the time. And so if they're all doing this at once, um, likely 
there's going to be a sperm and egg that meet up. And this Velger uh, state, again, is very small, um, but it's it can float around with the water and it's a little bit resistant to drying out. So this is what um, you're know, very concerned about humans uh, moving zebra mussels between lakes. And this is what can really get us because these things can, um, you know, it just in a little bit of water on your boat or your trailer or in your live well, um, it, they can survive long enough to move to different lakes. So that's why it's so important to remove your aquatic plants and dry your, your vessel completely, especially, or use a cleaner, especially if you're going to another lake soon. But so this is part of their strategy to have a life stage that is far more uh, easy to move around, you know, and then they choose somewhere to settle um, and they're stuck there. But um, the zebra mussels also have another interesting twist. Um, so all organisms are taking in energy. In this case, this is some nutritious, delicious algae going into the zebra mussels on the left side. Um, and the zebra mussels kind of uh, can expend that energy um, in two different ways, generally. Um, you can grow or you can reproduce. Um, and it's good to grow because as a zebra mussel, that means you can uh, produce more gametes the next time around. And it also means that you're a little bit resistant to uh, low oxygen levels. Uh, so the larger you are, you do a little bit better with that. Um, so if, if times are good, if the food quality is good, zebra mussels will do both. They will grow and reproduce. What happens if the food quality goes down? Um, so uh, yeah, indicated by the less tasty looking algae over here. Um, is the zebra mussel still going to grow or is it going to reproduce? It's a trade-off. You can't do both. So the zebra mussel actually does something kind of noble. Um, if times are changing and the other environmental cues are involved in this, but in general, if the food quality goes down, it sacrifices growth for reproduction. It's still going to reproduce. And basically, you know, the reasoning is that if times are not so great here, this individual might perish, the zebra mussels might not make it, but they can still try to make another generation who at least have the ability to leave that body of water and find another home. So that's my attempt to make zebra mussels seem like good parents and make them a little relatable. Um, yeah, so they're producing lots of gametes. Um, few survive long enough to settle down. These, this investment is based on environmental conditions. And that's, that's not specific to zebra mussels. That's something a lot of organisms do, but I wanted to point it out because it's kind of an interesting, that trade-off idea. Um, and one of their obstacles, of course, is humans who clean their watercraft. So it is a good reproductive strategy, but we have definitely kind of been taken advantage by it or kind of caught by surprise at how easy it is to transport those villagers and obviously... Um, when they first arrived in the Great Lakes, that was on a, a ballast water, um, likely from a ship. So that was one way that they were able to kind of that that reproduct or that uh, life life stage that's free floating. It can move um, really paid off for them. We've got one more. Um, I have to talk about leeches. Um, <laughs> I know leech reproduction was what brought everyone here today. Um, so, so uh, we have dozens of species of leech in Wisconsin. Um, uh, and they are kind of scary because some of them, uh, they are parasitic or predatory, and a lot of them will, uh, you know, attach to you and try to drink some of your blood. But there's actually fairly few diseases you can catch that way. I'm not saying you should let them do it, but it's not um, it's not as maybe as concerning as as it's, it's more uncomfortable and scary. Um, and I also had to include this uh, fascinating probable leech fossil from uh, right here in Wisconsin. This is 400 million years old. Um, so... If humans survive for 100 million years longer, we will be at least as successful as leeches. Um, so leeches are actually, um, the really interesting thing about leeches, what, the, what do they do that's unique? Um, they're hermaphroditic. So the leeches will all start out um, in the in breeding season. They can do it several times a year, but they're all going to start out producing sperm. Um, and the leeches then go and they will they'll find another leech. And they'll basically have a packet of sperm that they inject the other leech with, almost like a hypodermic needle. And then they, they will keep that packet and they can fertilize themselves with it because they switch over to making eggs. Um, and they can take the sperm that they have and fertilize those eggs. And what this picture is showing a bunch of cocoons on the bottom side of a leech with a bunch of eggs in them. And so that leech, you know, found a leech, uh, got inseminated, um, switched to making eggs, uh, and fertilize those eggs with the sperm, and now it's got a bunch of young on its underside. So right away, you can see how being hermaphroditic is an advantage because you don't need a male and a female leech to encounter one another during the breeding season. You just need any two leeches um, can make it happen. Um, and so the fact that they all produce sperm at once, and then they switch to eggs, and they can actually switch back 
um, if there's another, if there's enough, you know, uh, cues for another breeding cycle to go through. This, again, this is a matter of weeks, so it's much faster than fish. Um, so, so having the ability to be hermaphroditic and switch back and forth is really advantageous in terms of, you know, the leeches need to fertilize, uh, fertilize internally. They're not zebra mussels. You can't just have the sperm and eggs floating in the water. You need to find another leech. And so the fact that, you know, basically you're twice as likely, uh, or, or you don't have to find a leech of the opposite sex, you can find any leech. Um, but I also want to point out that uh, leeches actually, so parental care is not just for charismatic vertebrates. Um, the leech, so there are some species of leech in, uh, in particular that actually do things like this. So um, in, in the diagram on the right side, this is from a paper where leeches were observed. Um, they've actually got some young who hatched on the underside of the belly. So this is parental investment. They're letting the young tag along after they've hatched. And um, you know, this is probably slowing the leech down, probably making it more vulnerable to predators, but it's doing it for its young. And the other thing going on in this diagram is that it's grabbing an aquatic worm and holding it so that the young can feed off of it. So it's actually capturing prey for the young while who are hanging out on its underside and uh, feeding them. Um, so that's some like pretty complex parental behavior for this invertebrate leech, um, who is otherwise not a very uh, complex organism. But um, it's like it, you know, this idea of parental involvement in this for this particular species, um, the leech found to be really advantageous to provide that for its young. Um, so, so leeches will fill out our chart here. Um, they're, you know, they have several dozen offspring. Again, each of those, uh, these little individual leeches here and like eggs in these little cocoons here. Um, Hermaphroditism is, is a, something that really helps them out, you know, in, in terms of finding a mate and having all the, and then all the leeches in one lake can all be carrying young instead of half of them. So that's a, the kind of just the math works out there. It makes sense. Um, some species provide more parental care than others. They found it to be advantageous. There's some, there's a theory that, you know, the species that are protecting their young a lot are doing that because of predatory snails in their environment. Other species, they found that they don't need to invest that. They can leave the cocoons on the bottom of the lake and they do okay. Um, so yeah, I mentioned that internal fertilization needs to happen for leeches. So that's kind of maybe um, part of the reason why um, their hermaphroditism is especially advantageous. And they also have lots of predators, so they're kind of dealing with the fact that they're at the bottom of the food chain. Um, we do like having leeches around because they're an important part of the food chain in aquatic ecosystems, big food source for fish and insects and other things. But um, yeah, well, that, uh, that fills out our chart. We've had two vertebrates on here, the two fish. We've got an invertebrate crustacean. We've got uh, the zebra mussel, and we have an invertebrate leech on there. And they're all kind of doing different things, but you can see, hopefully, I've made the impression, you know, that A, reproduction is a really uh, important thing to consider when you're trying to get the character of an organism, right? Like, how does it uh, fit into its environment? How has it evolved? What is it... Um, trying to, you know, uh, how does it fit into its niche in the ecosystem? It's really important to look at reproduction as, um, you know, a really great way of understanding that organism. And also it's a critical way that we interact with these organisms, right? If we um, do something that impedes their reproduction or affects them at that critical timing or their critical stage of life, um, then, then that effect can be quite large. So I I think I will, oh, there, yeah, there's my last slide. So thanks everybody for, for listening to, Running the lakes again. Um, I would I would say uh, you know we'll do some questions right now with the uh, the caveat that this is not actually what I work on most of the time at DNR, but that's okay. We'll we'll see what we can do. Awesome, Justin. Thank you so much. We do have about ten minutes for a little Q and A time. Again, folks tuning in virtually, we'll take those questions as they come in. And anyone in person, just feel free to raise your hand. Hi, uh, I don't think of leeches as being common in our lakes. Are they really? Yeah, um, uh, I think a lot of the time they're they're not easy to see. Um, you know, they'll be hanging out in places you wouldn't see them. There was a study um, in the early in the early nineteen hundreds that made an estimate of a hundred million leeches in Lake Mendota. So they're they're definitely around. Um, yeah, I think they're just less likely to be in maybe the, the near shore area where we're looking. Or else, you know, they're they're also very small, and it definitely would vary from lake to lake and year to year. It's the type of thing where some lakes are really favorable. If there's a lot of fish in a lake, um, I guess with all the bluegill and and the small panfish that we have around, I would expect them to be 
predating the pond leeches pretty heavily. So maybe that's part of the reason we don't see them here. I know that if you have a lake um, that were to, if you if you had a lake freeze solid and all the fish died off, you know, a winter kill situation in a smaller pond, then leeches can really take off um, and do very well in that lake. Um, I have two questions about zebra mussels. One is in the Madison Lakes, has their population, do you think it's near its peak or could they double, quadruple, keep going? How far are they from what you think their peak must like be? And then I have one more question. Um, yeah, I don't know. I know there are efforts under to, to monitor zebra mussels. Um, I think CFL is, is have or um, have also you know sent scuba people out to to kind of get a population estimate. I think that in Lake Mendota, there is not so much of the hard, like rocky substrate that I would expect that they are kind of nearing the the peak of their population, or if they haven't reached it already. But there can be other things going on, right? If there's like a virus or something or a disease that affects the zebra mussels or something, then the population can swing. But I would expect that at some point, in you know, since they arrived, they have pretty much found all of the area that they can colonize. And then one other thing about zebra mussels: what have they done in the Madison Lakes um, that's negative in the ecosystem? Have they caused any other species to collapse, or or is it kind of a modest, like how severe, like what kind of uh, yeah, I'm, severe things? I'm not the best one to answer that question. What we'd be concerned about is again, if they if they filter to feed out all the algae, then that's fewer algae for other things to eat. Um, and then also there's there's some idea that if you are removing all the nutrients and then remember they excrete on the bottom of the lake. So it's kind of like taking a bunch of things and putting them on the bottom. That might cause some other types of, of algae to, to really take advantage of those nutrients at the bottom of the lake. And that can cause other changes. Um, but it's really like, you know, it's like several steps. So like first zebra mussels come in and they cause this and that causes this. And so at that point, you really need to be or specifically examine the lake in particular to see what the effect is going to be. And I haven't been you know, following those results. Yeah, it does sound like collapse in some certain species of fish that like they just really run up that you know of. That I know of, yeah. I I I mean fish populations also change very rapidly year to year. You have good years and bad years for fish. And so linking that to zebra mussels would be Difficult, maybe, but um, there might be that. That I wouldn't be surprised if that type of research is going on. I one from online here, Justin. Um, we have a couple actually. I go to one and then let Danny go back to the room. Uh, somebody wanted to know um, the wetlands in our watershed, a lot of them being close to the road, shopping malls, developments. How does road salt affect the health and reproduction of fish that need the wetlands to reproduce in them? Yeah, that I mean, that's a great point. Um, in general, the fish. You know, the smaller they are, and those eggs and fry are especially vulnerable to things like uh, road salt and chloride. Um, so when you know, when ecologists think about, um, you know, how is this fish going to be uh, affected by a pesticide or, or by this contaminant or something like that, it's often they're they're going to look at the young, um, and that is where you start to see effects uh, from both things like road salt and um, pesticides or fertilizers or or anything you know human human chemicals basically um so yeah i would say that that you know wetlands that are that are closer to a road it, it would be you know that would be a threat um especially if there's direct runoff that's bringing other other things on the road um you know just chemicals from cars and stuff and delivering that into a wetland um would be pretty bad um especially if it's at a time when pike are spawning and you get a rainstorm that washes a bunch of stuff in there so i think yeah like a, a really good general practice is to you know look at the runoff coming into your wetlands um and uh, the more you can slow down that water as it approaches, um, the you know more likely some of that those contaminants will settle out of it. And road salt's a big problem because it it doesn't degrade, right? It's a, it's an element, so it's going to stick around a lot more. Um, but that's definitely, I would say, like yeah, that was that was one way that road salt can have like a a stronger effect on a species if it yeah if it gets into the um, wetlands at a time when fish are trying to reproduce there. Right. I think we had another question up here. Thank you for the great talk, Justin. Um, what happens if we have a really cold spring and the pike are looking for a 45 degree temperature in the wetlands? Do they not reproduce at all or do they look for something else? I th uh, they'll wait. 
Um, and so the timing of their, you know, when they go, I think they will wait till the, till the water gets to 45 degrees. So when that happens in the year can vary. Um, and obviously that has other effects, right? So if, if it gets later and later, um, then other things are going to be happening at the same time. Human activities will be different. Um, but yeah, and like weather and water levels definitely affect their success in the spring. So it will vary from year to year. But I think in most years, you know, they're going to give it a shot and some will some will be successful. Often for fish populations, it's the kind of thing like you have a bunch of like years that are like, okay, and then you have one amazing year that where all the fit, like everybody produces and there's tons of food and it's really good. And then those fish become the ones who are breeding, but, you know, uh, many years down the line. And also, um, do any species benefit from the increase in mussels and zebra mussels? Um, yeah, so I mean, some algae like that grows on the bottom of the lake definitely benefits. Um, there's probably not too many species that we like that are benefiting. Um, I think there's a, there's a lot of questions of whether some fish can eat the zebra mussels or how nutritious it is for them. But um, I don't think bluegill are eating a lot of zebra mussels or you know other game fish that were um, that we really like in the Madison Lakes. Yeah. Thank you. This is actually a really interesting one. Uh, someone wanted to know. How do the hatcheries fit into the charge? Are they seen as an obstacle or a benefit to the gene pool? Like the like a fish hatchery so that we run as yeah. yeah. Um, that I don't you know I don't know too much about. I think the the hatcheries have different strategies. Um, so I think they they do they do do a lot of thinking about like you know um, if you're raising fish in a hatchery like. They have to be conditioned to certain conditions, then put in a stream. Um, I think that what they're doing is they are thinking a lot about genetic variability is really important, right? So if you were to take a bunch of fish from a hatchery that were, you know, had all been raised in the same way and then, you know, put them in a place where they weren't prepared for, I think that that wouldn't go well. So I think a lot of the times the hatchery is trying to supplement the, the natural reproduction that's going on. I know in some cases it's more of a, you know, a, a management decision where it's like, well, uh, you know, we really want to have a good fishery in this area. So in some places it's, it's replacing natural reproduction that maybe is happening less often because of habitat loss or something like that. And in some cases, the goal is to give extra variability, genetic variability population or take um, harvest eggs from really uh, robust population and reasoning that those genes are really good and then use that in the hatchery. I don't, I guess I don't have a great answer, um, but I know that the managers that are thinking about um, things like, you know, having good genes in the population and and where to use those uh, hatchery fish strategically um, for both, uh, you know, creating a, a sport fishery and for encouraging natural reproduction. It probably depends on what, you know, the goal of their, that particular project and what the species is and where the young are going. Justin, thank you. I want to be respectful of everyone's time in the ad water. Thank you so much today, Justin Shenmue, for talking about love in our lakes. A few things, if you did have any questions that we didn't get to, those joining virtually that might have had questions that we didn't get to, please feel free to send us an email, info at cleanlakesalliance.org. We'll make sure that question gets sent out to whomever can actually answer it. Um, of course, this entire presentation will be on YouTube tomorrow, so if you wanted to rewatch or you wanted to share it, that link will be available. Our next one is actually going to be a field trip. So get your permission slips ready. Um, Tuesday, March 12th, Clean Lakes 101 Science Lab will be a field trip. We will be going to the Madison Metropolitan Sewage District to learn about all the exciting things behind water treatment. It's actually a, a pretty exciting experience to do so. So thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Have a great Valentine's Day.